Okay, just a sec. All right. Um, so uh, first up uh, is the is the man who doesn't need an introduction but gets one anyway. Um, so first up, we've got uh, we've got Elko. Um, and for those who maybe don't know yet, because I did see a couple of fans of people attending uh, NixCon for the first time, um, Elko is the person that we have to thank for uh, for for the initiation of Nix, basically, because he worked on that uh, during his uh, PhD research. Um, and uh, today um, is, however, not the time to look back. But today, uh, Elko is going to tell us about uh, what lies ahead uh, for Nix, uh, the roadmap of the future of Nix, basically. Right. So please give him a hand, uh, Elko. Thank you. <laughs> I guess, does this work? Does this, can you hear me? Okay, great. Okay, so first of all, uh, thanks to the organizers. And uh, apart from that, let me say that uh, talk about uh, external monitors being hard to configure on a NixOS is fake news. I just <laughs> plugged it in and, and it worked. It's magic. Um, yeah, so this uh, this talk it was originally ca called a uh, Nix roadmap, but uh, there is no Nix roadmap. It's towards a Nix roadmap <laughs> uh, because this uh, should really be a community effort. So this is uh, sort of a uh, starting point towards a, uh, a roadmap. Uh, so people have been saying for years that we should have a roadmap. Uh, so lately, I've been doing a lot of uh, Rust programming. I've been really drinking the Rust Kool-Aid. So uh, whenever I have a problem now, I ask myself, what would Rust do? So it turns out uh, Rust, they, they have an RFC for everything. They have a beautiful process for everything. Um, so uh, yeah, so why should you have a roadmap to begin with? Well, so uh, they answer that. So, it, uh, uh, so the main thing is that it allows the world to see how, what are sort of the, the long-term plans and the strategic priorities. And it allows all the developers to, to hopefully get behind that. And, and so uh, everybody is hopefully uh, So hopefully then everybody is uh, kind of pointing in the same direction. Um, and another thing they mentioned is that, uh, uh, so they have a rapid release cycle, uh, but it, it turns out that that kind of meant that uh, sort of bigger uh, features, uh, sort of long-term uh, projects were sort of falling by the wayside uh, because they don't really fit into that rapid release cycle. Uh, so establishing annual goals. So in 2018, we're, we're going to make the compiler fast. That's a, that's a way to really get people behind it and uh, uh, ensure that they uh, uh, spend time on that so that at the end of the year, they don't have to say, uh, uh, we failed to reach our goals. Um, so the process that they have, and I'm not necessarily saying that we should follow that, but uh, so they have an annual uh, roadmap uh, and so they have a process for for creating that roadmap. So they have a uh, they write a an RFC where they uh, gather problems that the community has, uh, and then from that they extract a bunch of goals. So uh, that sounds like a reasonable thing to do. And 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 then uh, they have a whole uh, uh, plan for the year. So in say February they start planning how to reach those goals, and then they start implementing them. So I, I'm not saying that that necessarily makes uh, a lot of sense for us, but uh, uh, at least uh, yeah, having a roadmap uh, for, say, 2019, saying these are the, the goals that we want for Nix, uh, that, that sounds like uh, a, a very valuable thing to have. Um, so in the rest of the talk, I'm just going to do a brain dump of some things that I think are problems with Nix, and, uh, and, and, and from that it follows that there are some goals that, uh, that we should implement. Uh, but this is just uh, sort of my ideas. And uh, so, so I would like to do kind of this RFC process and get everybody's input. And from that, hopefully, uh, uh, we can have, yeah, get a roadmap for 2019. OK. So, all right, so some problem statements. So 
So these are just some things that are currently problematic with uh, Nick. So for example, or, or, or things that I would like to do but I can't at the moment. So one is I would like to use Nix as a make replacement or a basal replacement. So um, and Nix has all these nice features, a purely functional language, uh, reproducible builds, isolation. Uh, and we do this for sort of large things like packages and for very small things like configuration files in NixOS. Uh, so it, it seems like it sh sh should be a perfect build tool as well. So for building things like uh, C source files or whatever other language you want to build. But there are a bunch of reasons uh, that currently you can't really do that at the moment. So I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, so that's one problem. Another, uh, Nix package options are not easily discoverable or configurable. So right now, uh, Nix packages have all sorts of options. So for example, uh, uh, a package function might have an enable foo uh, argument, but this is completely undiscoverable except by reading the Nix packages source code. And, uh, and it's also not configurable via Nix and for any other tool. So this is not very uh, uh, good UX. Um, another problem is that, uh, this is, and this is an increasingly big problem is that Nix packages and Nix OS evaluation is slow and it's getting slower all the time because the, uh, the, the sort of the level of abstractions that are used in Nix packages are increasing uh, and it uses a lot of RAM so uh, and actually it turns out that this problem is kind of related to the previous problem um, another one that, that comes up a lot is that Nix currently has no way to uh, handle secrets so things like passwords or keys, uh, you don't want to s store those in the Nix store because then they're world readable, which is bad. So you need to, to some way to, uh, to deal with them. Um, or, so another problem as an unprivileged, so right now if you want to pull something from a binary cache, uh, from an arbitrary binary cache, so you cannot do that as an unprivileged user. Uh, things need to be signed by a, a, a key configured by the administrator. So if you just want to pull some something from some arbitrary cache, you cannot do that as an arbitrary user. Um, another one, so uh, uh, closure bloat. So this is a, a fairly big issue. So in, in Nix, it's very easy to end up with uh, a package that has way more runtime dependencies uh, than it uh, than it actually needs. Um, so I'll also give an example of that later. Uh, so yeah, these are just some random problems. So uh, probably uh, many of you have other problems. Uh, so I'll be uh, interested to hear them. Uh, but so here are some goals. Oh, I skipped something. Yeah. So here are some goals uh, that that you can extract from those uh, problem statements. So these are more at a technical level. So by the way, if you look at the, the Rust goals, there are also a lot of uh, non-technical um, uh, goals there, like uh, uh, improve documentation, uh, uh, um, uh, evangelize in certain communities, uh, make the community more diverse. So that's all uh, great as well. Uh, uh, yeah, but but here I'm more focusing on, on technical stuff, but uh, we should definitely not restrict ourselves to that uh, in, in, in the roadmap. Um, yeah, so make Nix a compelling build tool, so a compelling replacement for Nix or Bazel, uh, for Make or Bazel, uh, uh, or, or, or something that can actually uh, uh, complement those tools. Uh, make the Nix store content addressable, so that's a very technical goal, but it's, uh, it's kind of related to all the others. Uh, make Nix packages discoverable and configurable. Uh, improve the evaluation efficiency. Uh, provide mechanisms to prevent closure bloat. Prevent, provide a way to store secrets in the Nix store. Uh, so yeah, these are just some uh, goals that I would like to uh, work on in the next year. And, and to some extent, I have been working on them. Um, so the rest of this talk is just uh, uh, s some random brain dump on, uh, on, on, on how these goals could be achieved. Um, so, 
Yeah, so first the goal, Nix as a build tool. So, so what do we need to get to that? So in a way, you can already do this. In fact, you could do that 10 years ago. In fact, there is a Nix make repository somewhere which has a uh, bunch of functions for building C or C++ uh, projects. Um, and, and that works fine, but the problem is, uh, so now you have your project and you're using these Nix make functions. Um, so you can run Nix build to uh, have incremental builds for your project and that's all great. So now you want to package this thing and put it in Nix packages. So you make a tarball containing your source code and your Nix expression. And now you want to write a Nix expression in Nix packages that uh, extracts this tarball and builds it. And there you run into the problem that you need to be able to call Nix from inside a Nix build because you're, you're using a Nix expression to, to uh, build your project. So instead of a make file, so previously you would call make, right? Uh, but now you have a, a Nix expression that builds your project. So you need to be able to call Nix build. But you're inside a Nix build already. And uh, so, so and, 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 and a Nix derivation doesn't actually have arbitrary write access to the Nix store. In fact, it only has write access to its outputs. So, uh, so this doesn't work. So now you have a very embarrassing situation. So you have a, uh, a, a package that's written that has a build system written in Nix, but you can't actually put it in Nix packages. You could put it in Debian probably, but you can't put it in Nix packages. <laughs> so, so this is not good. So you need, uh, need recursive Nix. Uh, so that's kind of a required feature. Uh, another not essential but very nice to have feature is uh, content addressability, which I'll come back to. Uh, and caching of copying files to the store. So a tool like, yeah, so if you have your project, which might consist of thousands of source files, so now every time you run Nix build, it has to read all those source files and, and, and copy them to the Nix store, or at least check whether they already are in the Nix store. So that's a lot of I.O. and that's uh, slow. So a tool like make prevent, uh, avoids that by, um, only checking timestamps, and even that can get slow for very large projects. Uh, but uh, yeah, Nix needs to hash all these files, so it, it actually needs to read all of them. Uh, so you, you want to have some kind of caching for that, and maybe in, uh, something like an iNotify daemon to uh, efficiently notice when files change. Um, but this is in the nice to have category. Uh, Right, so the content addressability. This is, has kind of been, a, you could say, a holy grail for many years. Um, so this is the property that, uh, well, I should s step back for a second. So if, if you remember, uh, so a Nix store path uh, contains a cryptographic hash. But that cryptographic hash is a hash of the derivation that built that path. It's not actually a hash of the content of that path. Uh, and, and, and this is why you need signatures on binary caches, uh, because you need to trust that some store path was actually produced by the derivation that it claims to be built by. Uh, and that could be a, a lie, so somebody could set up a binary cache uh, where, have, so you, you, you get a legitimate Nix expression, so that's for example, builds Firefox, and then you pull a binary from the cache that actually contains something completely different, like a Trojan version of Firefox. So uh, uh, yeah, th that's why you need signatures. Um, so in a content addressable store, the store path, th so the hash in the store path is actually a hash of the contents of that path. So you no longer need to trust anything, so you can just verify that, for example, in a path like this, Nick stores hash, you just check that the uh, cryptographic hash of the contents of this path is this. So a, a, a path basically contains its own proof of integrity. Um, so if you have this, then uh, yeah, unprivileged users can uh, install things um, from arbitrary binary caches. 
Uh, another very big advantage is that you get deduplication. So for example, if you uh, um, say you make an irrelevant change to something in the dependency graph, like you, uh, you make a white space change to glibc. So currently that causes the entire system to be rebuilt, uh, which is bad. And, and actually, yeah, not just rebuilt, but um, had duplicated in the Nick store. So you need twice the uh, storage space now. Uh, whereas with a content addressable store, uh, so because this change is irrelevant, it doesn't actually change anything to the output of a build, uh, it ends up being stored in the same location. So uh, that's, that's much nicer. Uh, and in fact, it, it does prevent rebuilds because if, for instance, uh, so you make that change to glibc, you still need to recompile glibc to discover that that change doesn't matter. But after that, you don't need to rebuild anything that depends on it uh, because you've already discovered that, uh, yeah, this glibc uh, is, is actually the same. So, uh, so, so, so it sort of acts as a barrier in the, uh, in the dependency graph. Um, yeah, so this is why content addressability would be a, a great feature to have. Uh, so, so a few interesting things about content addressability. It, it, to make this work properly, it really needs a perfect binary reproducibility. So that's currently not the case with Nix packages. Uh, so if you build a package twice, uh, you might actually end up with slightly different results. So for example, if a binary stores a timestamp somewhere. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of people are at work uh, to uh, improve that. So for example, there's a whole reproducible builds.org uh, uh, project. Um, that's that's uh, yeah, basically uh, improving all sorts of uh, packages and build systems to uh, um, to eliminate sources of uh, uh, binary impurity. Okay, so for the other thing, so uh, yeah, prevent, oh, sorry. <laughs> preventing closure bloat. So this is something of an obsession of mine. Sorry about that. Um, so in Nix, because of the way it detects, it, it finds dependencies, it's very easy to have an accidental dependency. So this is not the case in, say, uh, at Debian, where you specify de dependencies so you don't end up with an accidental runtime dependency on, say, the C compiler. So here, for example, there was a situation where uh, Thunderbird was storing its build configuration so you can do about config in the URL bar and it will show you the path to the C compiler used to compile it. Um, which is, of course, a, kind of a useless thing. Uh, but it does yeah, add 1,200 megabytes of uh, blow to the closure. Um, and uh, yeah, so this can happen very uh, accidentally. You don't get any errors if you do that. Uh, so uh, yeah, we need better tools to, uh, to yeah, detect when this happens. So we already have some attributes that you can specify in in uh, Nix expressions, for example, you can say uh, disallowed requisites uh, to say that something should not have a runtime reference uh, to, say, the C compiler. Uh, but this is very limited. For example, you cannot do any pattern matching. Uh, you would like to say uh, this thing should not have any references to developer outputs. Um, and it should be per output because, for example, your death output probably should be allowed to have references to other uh, dev outputs. Uh, and, and you might want to have a size check. So for example, if say the Nixos ISO suddenly gets a gigabyte bigger, then uh, we'd like to uh, get some uh, error. So what I recently implemented uh, partially, so not all of this works yet, is that you can specify per output check. So for example, you can say uh, uh, the output, the out output should not have a closure bigger than 256 megabytes. It should not be, should not reference the C compiler or any dev output. But the, the dev output itself can reference anything, but it should not be larger than 128 kilobytes, uh, as a random example. Uh, so uh, yeah, so we can start 
putting these things in Nix packages. It could even be a generic thing. So, for example, the rule that things should not allow, should not be allowed to reference uh, dev outputs is something you could actually put in standard env. So, uh, as a as a general policy. Um, so, yeah, that would be very nice. Uh, how am I doing on time? Actually, I can just check. Okay. Ah, great. Uh, so, yeah, now I come to the really wild and vaporware part of the talk. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, really a, a big issue is discoverability and, and efficiency, like I mentioned. So, uh, Nix packages have basically no discoverability. Well, I mean, you can discover that they exist <laughs> sometimes. I mean, Nix env doesn't necessarily recurse into everything, but. Uh, so you can see that packages exist, but you can see what options they have. Uh, and customizing packages is also very ad hoc. It's sort of evolved. It's not really a properly designed thing. So we have these things like dot .override, dot .override derivation config. Um, and, uh, and in fact, this, this whole dot .override thing is, is, is kind of disastrous for, uh, for performance. So it's really one of the it's one of the two main reasons why Nix evaluation takes a lot of memory. So the, so dot override basically destroys the ability of the uh, garbage collector at runtime to actually collect any garbage, because you call a function, so you pass it some arguments, which can be very big, uh, because they're arbitrary dependencies or uh, a large graph, um, and uh, and then the output just contains the inputs. So the inputs can never be garbage collected. So uh, this, is, this was yeah, kind of a bad idea, but we, we don't really have anything better. Um, so there's kind of a, a meta issue here of all these things. Uh, so somewhere along the, the way, we, we forgot that Nix is intended as a domain-specific language <laughs> for specifying uh, uh, build graphs and configurations like, like NixOS systems. Uh, but as a DSL, it's not really doing a great job. So for example, it has no concept of a package or an option or a configuration or things like plugins. So any f sort of features you, or, or concepts you might expect in a DSL intended for doing these things. So, um, so maybe we need to get back to uh, uh, well, we need to improve Nix as a DSL. So, so one thing that I've been thinking about is, um, is so essentially turning the NixOS module system or an improved version of it into a language feature, into something called a configuration, which you can really think of as an, an attribute set, an extensible attribute set, which is really what a NixOS configuration is. Uh, it's, a, it's a bunch of att attributes that you can change. And so if you change one attribute, it can trigger other attributes to change. Um, yeah, so, so a configuration is an attribute set which contains attributes called options that can be set uh, and they can be overwritten later. Uh, but unlike attribute set and like NixOS options, uh, they can have types and documentations and uh, merge functions, and, and that's the thing that gives you discoverability. So uh, things like uh, package options can be expressed in this way, and because they have uh, things like a description and a type, uh, tools could uh, can discover them and present them to the user and then allow them to be changed programmat programmatically. Um, so. So the, the, the sketchy design for this language feature is a bit like this. So uh, a configuration looks a lot like an attribute set, only it uses angled brackets. Uh, my change, don't get too angry or, or enthusiastic about the syntax. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, so it's a, you could think of it as an attribute set. So we have an attribute foo, an attribute bar, and an attribute ABC that actually refers to foo and bar. So it's a recursive, it's like a rec uh, attribute set. 
so if, if from this thing you select the ABC uh, attribute, you would get a value one, two, three, because bar is true, so if, if true, then one, two, three, right? But what you can now do is take that m configuration module and apply uh, a, a, a new module to it that sets bar to false. And so now if from this module you select ABC, then it will return uh, if false, then uh, it goes to uh, one, two, three times two, so it will return uh, two, four, six. So this, this is pretty much exactly the behavior of the, uh, the MixOS module system. Um, yeah, and then the idea is that you can have some sort of syntax, uh, which I'm not sure about, but uh, to, to attach fields or annotations to those, uh, to those options, like uh, documentation, a type, default value, and so on. Uh, uh, merge functions, uh, priorities, uh, uh, yeah, all that sort of thing. All, all, basically all the things you have in the MixOS module system. Um, right, but now the idea is that we can apply this to building packages. So rather than having packages as functions, which have the problem that, um, well, th there's uh, no override mechanism, I mean no good override mechanism, there's no documentation, uh, and so on. Um, we, we can basically treat packages in the same way as uh, the NixOS module system uh, treats system configurations. So you, you build a package in, in sort of a modular way by combining a bunch of modules. So for example, you could have a, a very, sort of at the bottom you have a, a module that captures the concept of a derivation. So what is a derivation? Well, a derivation in Nix has a, a name and a version, and it has a builder, and it has arguments, and it has an environment. Uh, and if you set those things, then you can evaluate a derivation attribute, uh, which produces a, a low-level derivation. Um, so, so this is very low level, uh, but now you can build higher level modules on top of that. So for example, this thing basically expresses uh, the, the basic standard environment, so the concept of uh, phases uh, and, and, and dependencies on other packages. So this thing adds a, an option called build inputs and an option called phases. Um, and it, it implements this on top of the uh, lower level derivation module by uh, setting builder and arcs and env, uh, and that causes uh, a derivation to be computed uh, yeah, that uses these things. So just to continue this a bit, so you could have a module that captures the concept of a package, so a package has a description and a home page and so on. Uh, and all these things have, have descriptions and they have types, so they're, they're discoverable. Uh, and, and you get error messages, so for example, if if you use this uh, previous, so, so currently with derivations, if for example you, you misspell build inputs, uh, you're not going to get an error uh, because uh, a, a Nix derivation is, is basically just a bunch of environment variable bindings. So uh, yeah, so there's no checking whatsoever there. Uh, but here, if you set an, an option that, that uh, hasn't been declared, uh, then you get an error message, just like in the, in the module system. Uh, yeah, so you can um, build higher and higher level abstractions on this. So for example, you can ex extend the uh, sort of the generic standard environment with the concept of a Unix package, which for example has a configure phase and a, because it runs a configure script, uh, yeah. And then finally you can define a package. So a package is something that extends the Unix package module with something that sets a name, uh, description, source, uh, but it also uh, has its own option, namely enable GUI. Uh, so in this fictional example, uh, Hello World has a <laughs> GTK support. So now you can say build inputs is if enable G GUI, then uh, use GTK. Uh, and, and this thing is now discoverable. So 
Uh, you could have, say, a mix query package command which will show that this thing has an enable GUI uh, option. And then you could have a nix install command uh, that, uh, that, that allows you to set that option. Um, so, yeah, and, and you could override things using the exact same module system. So that, just like in NixOS. Um, so that's about it. So there are lots of other things you could imagine for the roadmap. I'll skip that. Uh, so yeah, so what I should do is create a sort of a, a roadmap issue uh, and where everybody can go wild with uh, ideas and suggestions and then we should try to synthesize something workable from that. Um, uh, so yeah. Uh, that's it. Thank you. So we, uh, we have time for three minutes questions. So you guys want to take three questions if there are any? So for the configurations idea of doing overrides, how does that solve the memory issue? Don't you still need to hold on to the references, to all the inputs? Uh, no, because as soon as you um, evaluate the .drv attribute, uh, you don't need anything else anymore. You can, at that, after that, you can just discard uh, everything that went into it. So, so it's sort of it. like in NixOS, if, if you evaluate System.build.top level, um, you get a derivation out of that, and, and and at that point you can garbage collect all the inputs to that thing. Oh, so like the when when you're passing something as an input to something else, you're passing to the .drv, not the composable. Right. Thing. So okay. presumably, this is all fiction. <laughs> so so here, uh, this GTK thing would trigger an evaluation of GTK.drv. Um, implicitly. Uh, on the slide about the Nix as a build tool, uh, you have been talking about avoiding rebuilds and, and similar properties. Uh, have you looked into the uh, recent paper, uh, Build uh, Systems a la Carte by Neil Mitchell, Simon Pinter Johnson, and Andrei Makhov? They're analyzing various build systems there, and Nix is one of them, and Nix uh, ticks uh, of almost all features of the ultimate build system. Uh, Was that the ICFP paper? Yes. Okay, yeah, I, I, it's on my to-do list. Really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Please take a look at this. Uh, it gives uh, very good names, a good glossary to talk about right. those properties. It's a great paper. Thank you. Okay, one more. Um, so the configuration um, options. Um, uh, it excites the type system in me. Um, uh, no, I won't go there. Um, is there also, um, so the NixOS module system also supports the notion of, of overlays? Mm -hmm. Is this, should, is there a version of this also in this or is this then kind of extension? Yeah, probably. So th that's sort of a high level thing that uh, I haven't figured out yet, so how you actually put these things together. Um, so I, but you need some way to do that, and uh, uh, yeah, so I don't know yet. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I think we've got to move, okay, maybe one more. <laughs> <laughs> Last one. It's more of a policy question. The, I've seen a lot of commits, like fixing Thunderbird, like you showed. And uh, there has been commits for every separate packages. Uh, why don't you enforce this kind of uh, like, do not reference GCC for all the packages by default, and then if some package really needs GCC, then you could enable it. Right, well, th that's kind of the point. So we don't have a way really to enforce that yet. Um, so right now it's really only if people sort of notice that suddenly a, a closure has become much bigger. Um, 
so you, you, you can use these disallowed requisites attributes, but very few packages do that. But you could use that by default, like add uh, that to unkey the revision, and then by default just do not reference GCC. There is no reason for most packages to do so. Right, so probably for GCC that would work, but y y you really want to do say things like it should not reference any def output, and, and that doesn't work at the moment because def outputs should be allowed to reference def outputs. So you, you can't use the existing attributes for that. Uh, and uh, b but yeah, so I would definitely like to have in, in NixOS, for example, that we say that uh, all the NixOS uh, VM tests could just check that their closures don't have any uh, def outputs in them, and, and, and no C GCC or Clang. So that that would already help quite a bit. Okay, alrighty. So thank you again thank you. for your talk.